but it really boils down to two ideas. One is what did the words mean to the generation that wrote it, or what do the words mean to somebody here today? And in, as long as judges are allowed to interpret the Constitution by some theory of today, they've become lawmakers. We're here at CPAC 2011 uh, Conservative Political Action Conference with Dr. Michael Ferris. You're a chancellor of Patrick Henry College, right, right. Uh, head of the Homeschool Legal Defense. Right, I'm the Where, chairman. And I do. The, you were the founder. I'm the founder. Right. So hopefully we can cover both of those. Uh, glad to. Thanks for taking right. the time uh, sure. with us. Uh, first of all, Patrick Henry College. Uh, how long have you been going now? Uh, this is our 11th academic year, and. Uh, we're about 300 students. It's uh, by far uh, the most uh, successful conservative college in the country, Christian conservative college, in terms of training people for government service, and particularly uh, those who want to go to law school, those who want to go into the uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, we have a really good reputation there. We've got uh, very high levels of success in those arenas. Now, you're in Virginia. We're in Virginia. We're in the, uh, a mile from right here. Uh, excuse me, a mile. We're an hour from right here. I, I'm glad I'm not a mile yeah, from right here. Yeah. But um, we're an hour from, from D.C., and we um, uh, train young people uh, in Christian Foundation and in the principles of the Founding Fathers. Everyone at Patrick Henry uh, takes a course in the Constitution that I teach, and uh, so it's... So you know they're getting they, uh, the Constitution. Right. We also have another um, year-long course in political philosophy called Freedom's Foundations. Basically, mm -hmm. why do we believe in freedom? Mm -hmm. What are the details of believing in freedom? What are the philosophical underpinnings of freedom? So we really make sure that our, our kids uh, really understand why we're a free people. Now, every public official uh, takes an oath right. to uphold and defend the Constitution. You will find almost no one that says they're against it. Everybody says they're for the Constitution. Right. But what is the real problem that, we, that we're facing as a society and a country uh, in that disconnect with uh, the reality of what we see, our drift away from constitutional underpinnings and the near universal belief that everybody says they have in the Constitution? Well, the, um, the disconnect is based on how do you interpret the Constitution. And there are two basic ways. There, you, know, you get five law professors in the room, you have seven or eight theories of how to interpret the Constitution. But it really boils down to two ideas. One is, what did the words mean to the generation that wrote it? Or, what do the words mean to somebody here today? And in, as long as judges are allowed to interpret the Constitution by some theory of today, they've become lawmakers. And the, the theory of self-government means the law is the law until another body of lawmakers changes it. And so the Constitution, like any other law, like a, a regular contract, should have the same meaning today as it had at the time that it was written. The General Welfare Clause was a limitation on government power, not a grant of government power. That's what the Founding Fathers understood. So Obamacare, is there a constitutional basis for that? No, there is not, because the General Welfare Clause means when you spend money lawfully, you must do so on these for, delegated powers. You must do so for for the general welfare, rather than to aid your buddies. Mm -hmm. It's not a separate grant of power. It is a separate and additional limitation of power. Mm -hmm. And when you understand the original meaning of the Constitution, uh, I mean, if this town had the original meaning of the Constitution, a third of the federal bureaucracy at least would go away. Uh, that's that's being pretty conservative. You, you could probably get it down a little, a little more than that. Right. But uh, a vast majority of what the federal government tries to do under the general welfare, necessary and proper, uh, and the commerce clause. The commerce clause. Ba basically, if you could fix general welfare clause and commerce clause, almost all of it goes away. Mm. Uh, so your students are getting a uh, a full dose of the Constitution with original intent and uh, understanding of the Federalist Papers and the basic documents right. of the Constitution. And and with that background. They're going off to top law schools. The executive editor of Harvard Law Review today is one of our graduates. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, sure. We have three students from last year whose graduating class they are at Columbia Law School. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're sending them out into the upper echelons of the legal profession, but with that solid grounding. They're not going there to get indoctrinated. They've already been thoroughly grounded in the truth. And the lies don't sound very good once you've been thoroughly grounded in the truth. And so um, with our moot court program especially, where we train people in legal argumentation, we've won the national championship uh, in undergraduate moot court five out of the last seven years. Is that right? And uh, we just won it again about a month ago at Tulane Law School. And 
how large is your school again? Uh, the student just, body? Just under 300. Yeah, but uh, the students then that are involved in the... Uh, Moot court? Yeah, right. We, we have actually about a quarter of our student body does, does Moot court. Is that right? Yeah, uh, or some other form of forensics. But uh, uh, no college is allowed to, to qualify more than eight teams or actually take more than eight teams to the top 64 in the country. Every year for the past six, seven years, Patrick Henry's qualified 10, 12, 14, 16 teams. Wow. We only can take eight, so I took eight again this time, and we had um, four of the top eight teams in the country, and we got first and third. Wow. Um, so not You're bad. Doing for, something. Not You're good doing something for, right. bad for a, a college of 300 where we're debating. Um, well, this last year we beat Princeton and Syracuse and Holy Cross and uh, Duke and year before we beat Harvard and I mean Harvard didn't it didn't come back to play hmm. so we beat them so you know soundly that they say eh, we're not going to do this anymore so. well so we can look forward to in the future some of them becoming law professors and litigators and uh, my goal is to train Supreme Court justices um, and my, my theory is if I flood the zone with uh, I teach a high school constitutional law class too not all of them come to Patrick Henry so I'm training about five six hundred young people a year in original intent and constitution. I've been doing it for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. And many of them are lawyers now. Many of them are, leg there's a few that are legislators now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I figure that some of them are gonna make the big leagues and hit the Supreme Court. Now, probably the first time I interviewed you was quite a few years ago, back with homeschool legal defense. Right. Uh, my parents were some of the earliest homeschoolers back in 19, early 1970s. And, uh, uh, homeschool legal defense and homeschooling have grown right. dramatically. What does homeschool legal defense do? We defend the right of homeschooling families to have free choices to homeschool their kids. And uh, we do that primarily in the United States. Um, we now are helping families in Germany and uh, in Sweden. Where There's they a ban famous case in right. Sweden going right. on now. Yeah, I'm, I'm co-counsel in the European Court of Human Rights for that family hmm. uh, in Sweden. And so, um, but well, we focus on uh, defending families' rights to homeschool. Mm -hmm. And we also fight uh, government agencies when they do unlawful searches and seizures uh, for child abuse investigations. Homeschoolers, because we're a little different, are, are subject to these whispered uh, allegations over the phone, these whispered rumors, that, I think they do this and such, and they call up child services. And so we've gotten to be fairly expert on defending Fourth Amendment rights. How has that improved or how has it deteriorated in recent years? Uh, the Fourth Amendment issue? Right. Uh, it has dramatically improved. Specifically as it affects homeschoolers. Well, true, but, but the cases we're winning, like we've won, uh, we've won big cases in the Ninth Circuit, we've won cases in the North Carolina Supreme Court, we've run cases in many other jurisdictions. Those cases help other people, not just homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the, the plain law is that the normal rules of the Fourth Amendment apply to social workers just as much as they do to police officers in mm -hmm. any investigation. You've got to have a warrant or you have to have probable cause based on an exigent circumstances, means which you have, a, you have an, a true emergency and you've got probable cause that there's a true emergency. Unless they've got those things, you can't get into somebody's houses. And social workers just think that the normal rules of the Fourth Amendment don't apply to them. And have these cases uh, kind of had an impact in chilling that kind of aggressive uh, to enforcement? To some degree. We, we're pretty successful in, in talking social workers and police officers away from violating the Constitution, but not all the time. When they, when they continue to violate the Constitution as they do, uh, then you know, we sue them. Mm -hmm. we, we go after them for federal civil rights violations. Uh, in fact, I was uh, on the phone driving down here today coaching a family who anticipates social services coming out soon because of the, you know, this child has this very special medical situation and one group of doctors are supporting the parents and there's one other rogue doctor out here that's threatening to turn them in for child abuse. And, hmm. um, and so we're, you know, gearing up for that. And, and so we do that on a regular basis. We have a lot of those cases that we have to deal with every year. Practical matter. So a family is homeschooling. Uh, I always tell people they should be a member of Homeschool right. Legal Defense because it, it's what, $100, something it's a, it's that? A, it's uh, about, if you join a group, it's $100. Right. Uh, like your state of support group, then we right. give you a discount. But otherwise, about $125. But, I mean, if you're going to have some kind of uh, uh, problem with the local authorities, the school right. district, or something like that, uh, uh, you guys are the experts in, in providing that right. defense. We've, we've done more of these 
Well, we've done more homeschool cases, obviously, than anybody ever. And we've actually probably done more Fourth Amendment cases. In fact, there's a law review article written about our Fourth Amendment work asking the question, why are these homeschoolers doing so many Fourth Amendment cases? So when you start attracting that kind of scholarly comment, we, we apparently are, are making a difference. Uh, and you have quite a few lawyers across the country that have uh, become knowledgeable in this area now that may not be specifically affiliated with your group, but work with you on these Well, we, we do have uh, local attorneys that we use, but we do the vast majority of work with our in-house lawyers. Uh, we have a, about a dozen uh, lawyers on full-time staff, and, um, and they become experts on particular states. And so anything that happens in, in Missouri, our guy that handles Missouri every day, in fact, he used to be a deputy attorney general in Missouri, um, is in our office in Virginia, and he uh, handles all the Missouri calls. And so, uh, but we, but if something's happening on the ground where we need to appear in court, then we turn to one of our, our local attorneys that we deal with, and we have them on a regular basis. But, but really, we, when people call HSLDA, they're going to be talking to a lawyer who does nothing other than defend homeschoolers. Now, if you were to say, what would you say now is the worst state and the best state in terms of circumstances for, for homeschoolers now? Well, there's a, there's a few states that would qualify for best state. Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia is one of them, Montana is one of them, Idaho is one of them, um, Texas is very good. Um, uh, worst states, um, Pennsylvania, New York, clearly are the worst two states. Um, and not so much that they're trying to ban homeschooling, they're trying to regulate it to death. Mm -hmm. And so a um, lot, of, lot of busy work, a lot of paperwork, a lot of rigmarole in Pennsylvania, which when you have rigmarole, you give local officials discretion, and discretion is the enemy of freedom. If uh, you were to look at the big picture, uh, homeschooling has obviously expanded tremendously over the last right. 30 years. Uh, where do you see it going now? Well, I, I think that we're going to see probably uh, up to 10% of the population homeschooling their kids. Best estimate, about 4% are homeschooling right now. Uh, I think you had a pragmatic limit of people that are willing to pretty much forego a two-income family scenario. You know, sometimes you can pull that off, but it's really hard. So you, you have to be a one-income family pretty much and, and, so, and be dedicated to, to doing this. And it's a lot of hard work. And so uh, I'm convinced that anybody who's willing to do the hard work can do a successful job. But if you're not willing to do the hard work, you know, mm -hmm. find some other way to educate your kids because we don't want people lackadaisically coming into the homeschooling movement. We want people that are say, yeah, I know it's a big job and I'm going to do it. Any, anything national that you're aware of in terms of national legislation that would have a uh, negative impact on freedom of parents for homeschooling? Well, the Obama administration, and Barbara Boxer and Hillary Clinton all want to see the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child ratified, as well as the Convention on Women, the CEDAW Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, the Convention on Children is especially dangerous to homeschooling, mm -hmm. uh, but the CEDAW Convention is also bad. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, they want to ratify these treaties that would give the government control over our families completely. And so we are leading the charge to uh, kill the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, we're helping others who are trying to kill all the other UN treaties. Right. And so we're part of a, a, a sovereignty coalition. But we're the lead um, uh, on, on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We're taking the lead role. Where, where does that stand right now? Well, it's never been sent to the Senate because they're afraid of us. Uh, and what we did last time, and what we're going to do again in this session after the election, um, is uh, uh, Jim DeMint introduced a resolution um, that condemned the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And our goal is to get 34 co-sponsors, because when you have 34 co-sponsors, you've got the votes to block a treaty. And so we had 32 official co-sponsors last time. We've elected some more re real Republicans this time. Uh, and so we, we don't think they'll have any trouble getting to 34. So that should be done in the next month or so. And so our goal is to, to block it. But we're also working on a, uh, a constitutional amendment that permanently eliminates the use of international law on the issue of parents. Um, and so uh, we, we don't want to have this treaty now. We don't want to have this treaty ever. Well, Dr. Ferris, thanks so much. Appreciate you taking time. Thank you so much.